So it's my great pleasure to introduce this panel, uh, which is going to explore issues of media literacy and news across generations uh, and in diverse contexts. It's, it's self-evident to say that we live in an age of information overabundance, and nowhere was this more evident than in the COVID-19 infodemic, where people both craved quality inf um, information and at the same time became increasingly fatigued by it. We are exposed more and more to poor quality and misinformation, but not everyone has the skills to understand or navigate this complex hybrid media landscape. We know that media literacy is one of the keys to, um, as um, our, our keynote speaker has so eloquently explained, a civic form of media literacy. But we don't currently have a coordinated system or network to bring media literacy skills across, um, together across the community. So um, this panel has been brought together um, for experts in quite diverse sectors of our, our media and information um, uh, landscape to tackle, um, who are tackling the media literacy pro um, problem uh, in diverse ways and, um, and tackling different parts of the problem. The presenters will discuss their experiences in media literacy education and research to consider the strategies um, that we as a community might adopt um, to enhance media literacy at different points of the life cycle and different, um, in the different contexts of our society. So our first speaker is uh, Dr Caroline Fisher, Associate Professor, Professor of Communication at the University of Canberra. Um, Car I know from first-hand experience that Caroline is a prolific researcher um, of news media consumption, journalism and political communication, among other interests. She also remains an active broadcaster um, and brings our research uh, alive for local and national audiences and she's, she's a, a gift to have to work with. Um, Caroline's presentation is titled Pulling Together, uh, the Need for an Australian Media and Information Literacy Network, which I think speaks to, um, to all of the, the information and presentations we've had so far. Um, I won't say too much because it's Caroline's uh, presentation, but um, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Kerry. That's great. Um, yes, so there have been lots of uh, references to networks and the need for a network approach to media literacy. And my... Um, oh, I'm not there. Am I there yet? There I am. Um, my presentation is going to give an example of how, what that might look like. Uh, for some people in the room, this uh, proposal won't be new, um, <laughs> but... Uh, and uh, it's great to see that the uh, federal government in its response to the digital platforms inquiry has supported a network approach. And again, this is a perhaps a template that they might like to adopt um, in, in thinking about that. So, all righty. So when did, uh, when did we first start thinking about this? At the News and Media Research Centre, one of our key flag flagship projects each year is the Digital News Report Australia, part of a global uh, research effort looking at uh, news media consumption, uh, and it's led by the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism at the University of Oxford. And uh, each year we ask different questions. In a couple of our uh, surveys, we've asked specifically about uh, media literacy understandings or knowledge. And it became very clear to us in our 2018 survey that uh, Australians on the whole had very, uh, had low to very low news literacy. Um, I won't go through all the questions that that entailed, but they were basically about knowledge of the Australian news environment, for instance, you know, is, is the ABC um, funded by advertising, you know, or by taxes, for instance. You'd be surprised to know very few people knew the answer to that question. So um, based on these, um, these types of questions, uh, we came up with this, with this finding uh, that, on the whole, Australians have very poor understanding of the news media environment uh, in Australia. So um, in response to that, we started to look into what media literacy programs are available here uh, and overseas. And we uh, conducted a massive review 
um, of uh, uh, current media literacy interventions. Uh, we did an a very big literature review of existing uh, literature into approaches and um, I attended a, a global conference in London in 2019 as well to speak to stakeholders uh, about um, current interventions. So uh, based on that, uh, and we are, so the question underpinning all of this was what works, you know, what, what, what does actually work and what did we find? So we found, first of all, that there's huge definitional problems. <laughs> you know, what is media literacy? Uh, and, you know, that was a class classic example of how many literacies can there be? You know, when there was a question uh, in Queensland about, well, what about data literacy? Well, next we'll be asking about hologram literacy. I mean, you know, there's media literacy, there's digital literacy, there's news literacy. There's all these literacies. Uh, and which, what do we focus on? Uh, so we concluded in our report um, that we would go for media and information literacy uh, because it's so inclusive and it does embrace this ongoing change uh, that will just keep on happening um, as technologies change and our needs for different types of literacies emerge. Um, and it's a term um, recognised by UNESCO. Uh, we identified a big evaluation gap. So in trying to determine what works, well, it was very hard to find out what works because there's almost been no evaluation done of, um, pra of programs here or overseas. So we need a lot more evaluation. We found also particular gaps in programs for certain groups, and this was reinforced uh, our data findings in the digital news report, that particularly people in rural and regional uh, areas, um, uh, there's very few groups for them, low socioeconomic, very few groups for them, and for the elderly as well, uh, few groups for them. <laughs> And that, you know, the, the most of the um, interventions and the programs offered are school-based programs, so for school-aged children, but very little for the wider community. And that's true, else, you know, overseas as well. Um, what was clear from the literature and from talking to uh, stakeholders overseas was that a combined online and offline approach is needed. Um, that these simple online checklists or one-off one videos are not the answer for meaningful improvements in literacy levels. They might be handy and a, and a helpful point of entry for short-term reference, but they are unlikely to lead to lasting behavioural change and will not reach many in the community. So online, a combination of online materials and offline face-to-face -face tuition is needed for that real behavioural change. And a network approach. Uh, seemed to be uh, the consensus that that would be the most beneficial way of moving forward. Why? To harness and coordinate existing efforts, to encourage collaboration, maximise current networks, partnerships and expertise, and to reach the widest cross-section of the community. Now, um, there are a couple of examples, uh, particularly from uh, the Netherlands and Finland, which were important here in, in developing this proposal uh, that I'll, I'll present. Uh, the most influential is the MediaWeitzer.net program in the Netherlands. The former director of uh, the NFSA, um, Jan Müller, um, he was the uh, director of that program when he was in the Netherlands and was very influential in influencing the alliance approach that AMLA has formed and also in informing me in developing this augmented uh, network model. So, what might an Australia media and information literacy network look like. Um, so as I said, um, there is an alliance that has already formed and again uh, influenced very much by this Netherlands model um, with Jan Müller's uh, input there. Um, but the, the thing about the uh, Netherlands model that is uh, different to what I'm proposing here is that when this was developed in the Netherlands in 2005, it was a very different environment. So in the Netherlands, uh, the government got in uh, early and started to address this issue. And so it was a very coordinated effort, bringing in the national institutions, etc., as the foundation, st forming this national steering committee and then uh, rolling out programs into schools. It has now begun to produce stuff into the wider community, but it's all coordinated and builds and adapts on those existing materials that were developed for the school programs. So the situation's quite different here. In 2019... Uh, because there's been such a void uh, in Australia, there has been no sort of government coordinated response. There, a lot of disparate programs have, have sprung up to fill the void. And so as a result, there's a lot of great work being done, but it's very fractured. And um, so 
In devising or thinking through this model, um, there are some adaptations made here to, um, to address the fact that there's a different environment uh, that we are in to what the Netherlands faced in 2005. Um, we have a crowded field already, but a very dislocated <laughs> crowded field. So, um, similar to the Netherlands model, um, that the, an Australian network would be underpinned by a steering group um, of CEOs from the key national institutions that already play a role in educating the public uh, and committed to lifting uh, media and information literacy standards in Australia. So the ABC, MOAD, National Film and Sound Archive, the Australian Library in and Information Association uh, and media literacy research institutions. Now, at the uh, centre of that is a program coordinator. Now, under this model, um, media literacy materials would be developed in consultation with an advisory group of media literacy providers, uh, such as First Draft, the Alana and Madeline Foundation, Be Connected and the ABC. Uh, the program coordinator could then um, produce and distribute materials uh, and they'd be managed there uh, in a central office. Ideally, this office could be based in one of the national institutions to make, take advantage of existing uh, infrastructure and to, to have the national status of that organisation. Um, they would then be able to oversee uh, the development of, online, of an online presence for the network and the distribution of materials um, and related resources. Then, of course... This only works because it has this, you know, this the ripple effect and this uh, this effect where you know develops a huge network of supporters. Um, now, this is just an example of what a possible some possible future partners might look like uh, for this model. I mean, within ten years of the Netherlands model, the MediaWeitzer.net model being established, they had uh, already eleven hundred partners in 10 years, uh, delivering uh, media literacy uh, um, to the community okay, and engaged in the network, which is phenomenal. So this is just an example. Uh, some you know, networks through networks, uh, through people on the advisory panel, etc. The, the way it might kind of, the web might build. So, um, I mean, what are the benefits of taking this network approach? I guess none of this is new to you, but there is a disparate media literacy, um, a, a disparate range of ventures um, in Australia at the moment. Um, and the advantage being rather than fund individual isolated programs, a network or alliance approach would create cohesion between school-based media literacy education and programs for adults and other target groups. This would maximise resources, increase consistency in approach and be easier to monitor and evaluate. Importantly, it would unify efforts rather than have individual providers working in competition with each other and fighting over crumbs of funding. A network approach that is championed by our national institutions would provide long-term leadership, advocacy and awareness to promote a culture of media literacy across the country. And... You know, during this process, um, we consulted with uh, media literacy, literacy stakeholders. All revealed uh, strong support uh, for this approach, except for one. <laughs> anyway, so this is where we're at. Um, I guess you'll get a chance to ask questions about this approach um, during the Q and A session. But thanks very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Caroline. Um, so we're going to hold questions off until all four speakers have had a chance to present. Uh, so just keep your questions in mind for Caroline because I think that's the horizon, isn't it? That's, that's sort of where we want to get to. Um, our next speaker is Saffron Howden. Um, Saffron is an author journalist and passionate media literacy advocate. Among other journalism roles, um, she was founding editor of Crinkling News, which I think you'll hear a little bit about today, um, and is the author of a new book called Kid Reporter, The Secret to Breaking News. <laughs> Um, in this presentation, Saffron uh, will demonstrate how the skills of journalism can help boost media literacy levels among school age and general adult populations. So I'd like to invite uh, Saffron. Hi, Saffron. Hi, Hi everyone. Hi. Thank you very much um, to the University of Canberra and, and WSU and QUT for inviting me to take part in what I think is this really crucial symposium. Um, 
I'm proud to have been involved in some of the seminal um, national research into news and media literacy levels in Australia. Um, and, um, and I've been an advocate for media literacy, especially for young Australians for um, the past five years, even as the problem of disinformation grows. Huh. Um, so I want to talk to you today about how we can turn those pesky journalist trades that politicians love so much, like nosiness and scepticism and asking lots of questions, um, into media literacy teaching tools. But firstly, I want to briefly mention Media Me. Um, so one Sunday in November in 2017, 35 children and teenagers aged between 10 and 15 came together in Sydney um, to develop a national media literacy action plan, and they were from um, around Australia. It was the first conference of its kind held in this country and it was hosted by the National Newspaper for Kids, which I co-founded, Crinkling News, with support from Facebook, Google, News Initiative, the New South Wales Education Department and, um, and quite a few others, including the Museum of Australian Democracy here in Canberra. The kids did a phenomenal job, I must say, um, and remembering how far we've come in the media literacy field in the last four years, this was pioneering and I think we still have a lot to learn from those 35 young people today. So they considered media literacy a life skill um, and with that in mind, this is what they recommended. They thought that uh, media literacy should be taught in schools um, and that it should be cross-curriculum. Um, they thought teachers should be trained in media literacy skills and that school students should be regularly exposed to more news and current affairs. They, short, they thought that young people should be given the tools to create media themselves and that every school should have its own student-created news media organisation um, like a newspaper or a podcast or a radio station, whatever it might be. And they also thought that all um, major news organisations should include more content adapted for a child or teen audience. They thought that news should be verified, um, and I think this is a trickier one, um, but these young media literacy leaders thought there should be a verification system for legitimate news organisations, and that social media platforms should operate under a um, shared code of ethics. And there's a, there should also be a national fact-checking agency. So it's useful that we've got um, you here, Peter, because AAP sort of operates as that for us in Australia. Um, Four, they thought that there should be guidelines for journalists to respect and include young people in their coverage of news, that parents should have access to more information about media literacy, and that news organisations and social media platforms should be more transparent. Um, so I think one of, the, one of the things they canvassed was fines for disseminating fake news, which was an interesting one. Um, and crucially, I think they said that social media platforms' terms and conditions should be a lot easier to understand, not just for young people, but for people generally. And finally, they recommended that the news media industry establish annual awards for child and teen reporters and also create an award for um, the best news story about young people. All of this sounds pretty sensible to me, um, but they require um, that elusive thing of getting educators, the government, education departments, the national curriculum, big tech, the news media, all in one room and all agreeing, which is, that was a joke. That was funny. Yeah. So... Um, Anyway, um, there, people are, as we know um, from today, um, that people are taking practical steps to improve news and media literacy levels in this country, especially in the past four or so years. Teachers of media, individual schools, not-for-profits like the Alana and Madeline Foundation, ABC Education, the Museum of Australian Democracy here in Canberra, um, even the global tech giants and, of course, um, the Library Association as well. And I'm really looking forward to hearing more about that. My most recent contribution has been um, to Kid Reporter, um, The Secret to Breaking News, which was co-written by Dana Quinn and myself. The book teaches an understanding of media by giving young people the tools to become reporters and media creators themselves. Um, it also acts on three of the recommendations that those young people made at Media Me. A, it's a vehicle for training media... Uh, for teaching media literacy in schools, B, it gives young people the tools to develop their own news media for an audience of their peers, and C, it gives parents plenty of information about how to understand and navigate the uh, media. Um, for those not familiar with the book, um, it's aimed at children aged roughly um, eight and up. It shows them how to research and investigate, fact check, edit, interview, write and produce news stories. Um, it teaches them what news is, what sources are, the role journalism plays in communities, society and democracies. It's also a bit of a how-to guide for a child or school wanting to start up their own newspaper or podcast or even TV-style news program. 
Most importantly for us here today, it provides guidance on how to be an information detective, so how to tell the difference between news and opinion and advertising, how to spot misinformation and disinformation, how to recognise perspective and bias, um, and how to test claims made in this sometimes fact-free, um, anything-goes world of social media. In short, I think it teaches that very core element of media literacy, which is critical thinking. Um, and it gives the kids, kids, kids the framework and space to make their own way there. So it's a sort of child-led practical learning drawing on case studies of kids who've, who've already created their own news media programs. Um, the fact is I think journalists have a lot of transferable skills that are useful for anyone trying to navigate the information overload of the digital age. They are natural, critical thinkers. They're wired through habit to question things, be sceptical, verify information before sharing it with others, and question the motivation of people making claims. Um, they are adept at assessing information independently um, with a sense of a wider audience or sometimes a greater good in mind. I am, of course, generalising, um, and journalism clearly has its own issues to resolve. Um, it's very imperfect, but I think that's a whole other symposium uh, to deal with. Um, if all Australians, young and old, um, ask these simple questions that I've got up here um, about all pieces of information and all media, I think we could be well on our way to a much more media literate society. Um, so who said it and, and what perspective are they coming from? Why did they say it? Can it be verified? Who is the intended audience for that information? How does your own experience of it influ influence your view of that information? And now, key, what do you do with it once you've answered all those questions? Um, here's an example from the book um, to give you a sense of how we try and sort of get this across. We encourage kids to look at this photo of a puppy um, and think about all the different people who might share that image and about how who shares it and um, their motivation for sharing it can actually change its meaning. Um, so the image might be used in an advertisement for a pet shop, for example. Um, it might be used in an information campaign by a government authority asking people to get their pets desexed. Um, it might be used by an animal rights group or it could be shared by a friend announcing the arrival of a new pet. Um, you can see, I think, what we're getting at here, which is that we're trying to encourage kids to think critically about information, where it comes from, why it's been produced or published and who the intended audience is. Um, this may seem really basic to people in this room, um, but we all know enough about the problem of misinformation and disinformation to know that these are not questions most people are asking uh, before they share or comment on posts on their own social media feeds. Um, to be sure, some journalists definitely need to ask these questions more often um, of information in their daily working lives. Um, so I've worked in the news media um, as a journalist and editor for a couple of decades now, but when Ramey Bianchi and I uh, founded Crinkly News, we were able to do something really special, aside from bring quality current affairs to kids, which was our aim, and that was to shine a spotlight on media literacy. It didn't take long for teachers and schools to realise that the newspaper was a vessel through which to explore news and media more generally, so we were able to begin directly tackling a lack of former media literacy education in primary schools, albeit on a fairly ad hoc basis, by developing Journalism for Juniors workshops for classrooms and community fora. Through these workshops, we, mainly, we taught mainly um, middle and upper primary school students basic journalism skills like research, verification, fact-checking, sources, interviewing, and, of course, how to write a good lead. And it was really these journalism and student newspaper workshops that were the inspiration for Kid Reporter. Um, I know I'm a, um, which I think is fantastic about this symposium, is that I'm quite a, a tradie in a symposium full of a lot of academics and researchers. My focus is on how we turn media literacy research into tangible action. Um, and I'm really glad that the organisers saw fit to include the perspective through this panel, um, of, of that, that kind of perspective, the practical perspective. I'm passionate about media literacy and in this day and age, I don't think we can be responsible informed citizens without it. We've already seen around the world the sometimes tragic consequences of um, unchecked, unverified and untrue information, most recently around COVID-19. Education, I think, can't start soon enough or young enough. Um, the benefits of teaching journalism skills, I think, to school students to boost media literacy um, is fivefold. It provides, I think, a useful framework for teaching those skills. It's an important avenue for kids to create media themselves in a really critical and ethical way. 
Um, it teaches young people the value of professional journalism. And I know in media literacy circles, um, as we've heard from our keynote, journalism and journalists aren't necessarily the, the most favoured people. And there's a big view that they contribute to the problem. I think the core skills um, that journalists have are what we're talking about here in, in, in what I think can be applied to the media literacy um, world. Um, so it teaches them public interest journalism and the role of the fourth estate in democracies and communities. It's a way of engaging the news media industry in education and encouraging them to co-develop and co-deliver resources, um, which we see a lot more of in places like the United States. Um, and it's also a way of giving young people a meaningful voice in their communities, which I'm personally really passionate about. Um, I'd like to end by reading a bit of an excerpt from Kid Reporter to illustrate how we encourage kids to recognise the importance of understanding the media and the message, any messages they consume. Before you can call yourself a reporter, you need to understand where information comes from, how it's created, how it's understood and what's done with it. Journalists are critical thinkers. That means turning over every bit of evidence, examining it and then making an informed decision about its, about its value. How do you tell the difference between a rumour, a lie and a fact? When does a statement become an opinion? Is it okay to have various perspectives or points of view on the same event? People have different ideas about the world. These are formed by family and friends, school, culture, heritage, religion, community, even government. All these influences on your life affect the way you see information and how you pass it on. And that is the same for every person in the world. Being aware of this helps us appreciate other people and respect their views, even when we disagree. It helps us understand our own perspectives and let us sort, lets us sort through and share information in a fairer, truthful way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Safra. What an amazing intervention that one is. That's just extraordinary. Um, okay, so moving on to our third speaker uh, is Peter Bodkin. Um, Peter is editor of AAP Fact Check, um, uh, and AAP, of course, is Australian Associated Press. Um, he's a specialist information and disinformation specialist. We haven't heard too much about disinformation today, so that will be um, really interesting. Um, who oversees the fact-checking claims made on social media and by public figures. Um, Peter's presentation will provide insights into the front line of, of, of tackling uh, misinformation in public media and will share the techniques and principles used by AAP Fact Check that will form the basis of adult media literacy resources that they're currently creating. So I'd like to invite Peter Bodkin. Okay, I wonder if I can move that for you. Oh my God, I've just stuffed it up. Sorry, I'll just, sorry, I'll just leave it alone. <laughs> Not the uh... <laughs> Got it. Thank you. So hi everyone. My name is Peter Bodkin. I'm uh, the editor of AAP Fact Check. Um, as mentioned, AAP is Australian Associated Press, National Newswire. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about fact checking, how we do things, and how we see that fitting into the the broader uh, umbrella of media literacy. So a bit of background to start with, um, AAP Fact Check is a self-contained editorial unit within AAP. Um, so AAP was previously, as some of you may know, uh, majority co-owned by Nine and News Corp um, up until early last year um, and then went through a rebirth as uh, a non-profit organisation um, and we're now, as of quite recently, a, a registered charity. So AAP has a proud history of independence and a reputation for credible, fact-based news reporting. And that's really the, the framework through which uh, our fact-checking unit operates. Um, our first fact-checks were published in late 2018, and since then we fact-checked multiple election campaigns, most recently the New Zealand election, um, also the, the last uh, Australian federal election. Um, we've also been a Facebook third-party fact-checking partner since uh, mid-2019. Mid um, and today we fact-check claims primarily on social media, um, 
primarily Facebook and Instagram, but also from public figures in news media. Um, and particularly through our work on social media, we see ourselves as being at the front line of misinformation because we often see the material that people are sharing that uh, is untrue, either unwittingly misinformation or people knowingly sharing things that they, uh, they know are false with an with a intention to mislead people, which is disinformation. Um, we see that stuff before it surfaces often in the mainstream later down the track. So the ways that we identify material to fact check and how we choose what to focus on um, go through a, kind of a series of filters. Um, we're constantly monitoring both news media and social media for statements that are being widely shared, something that's generating discussion, um, generating traction. And we have a particular focus on things that are misleading or false. So there's not that much value in fact checking something which is true, as long as everyone knows that it's true. Um, but sometimes there, there can be you know, a popular myth that can be dispelled, or there may be something which people think um, is untrue but is actually true. You know, there's a lot of different ways we can look at it. But our focus is on misleading information, and with that in mind, we often ask ourselves the question before choosing whether to fact check something, what would be the result if we didn't fact check this? So what's the potential harm of leaving this falsehood uncorrected? Um, each of our fact checks will include a clear statement of what it is that we're fact checking, an analysis that pulls that claim apart, drawing on experts and primary sources, and then a clear verdict, which is usually true, false, or somewhere in between if it's a, a mixture of uh, true and false claims. Those fact checks will then appear after we've published them prominently in Google search results. So if we fact check something to do with COVID-19, for example, and vaccines, if someone searches in Google for Pfizer side effects, a fact check, not necessarily ours, but maybe ours, will appear prominently in those search results. So that information is surfaced readily to, to people on the internet. Um, and in some cases, they're also those fact checks are also used by third party publishers. So we have partnered with various news organisations, particularly around elections. And then our fact checks will also be used in uh, print media, have been used in broadcast media to give them a wider audience. Um, for material on Facebook and Instagram, um, our, when we apply a verdict to a particular post, our fact check will then appear alongside that post so people can see um, accurate researched information that accompanies material that's being shared. So here's a couple of quick examples of fact checks that we've done just to give you an idea of the breadth of the material. Um, COVID-19 vaccine misinformation is one of the big ones that we've seen for more than six months now. Um, but there's a lot of material on social media surrounding COVID-19 vaccines that we um, fact check, debunk, analyse, and then on the, the right, a more traditional news media fact check, a statement from Scott Morrison um, regarding Australia's carbon emissions cuts. So these are just two examples, but we fact check a broad range of material. So some of the things that we've learned from our two years on the front line of fact checking, um, again, particularly in the, the social media and digital space, most mis- and disinformation on social media in Australia is not from Australia. So there are recurring themes that are the products of networks of like-minded people around the world. Um, particularly in English-speaking countries, most take their cues from the US. Um, so, for example, in Australia during the US presidential election, we started seeing a lot of material in Australia about repeating... Um, Donald Trump's stolen election claims. And people here are very heavily influenced by things that are happening in the US, to a lesser extent, extent the UK, and then after that, other countries. Obviously, there is some purely local content, but there is a strong network effect where if a really widely shared mistruth appears in the US, it will almost certainly appear in certain networks within a day in Australia. Um, the pandemic has thrown together some pretty unlikely groups. So one thing that we've seen 
since the start of COVID-19 has been the mixing together of groups that you think would be not logical bedfellows. So everyone from QAnon conspiracy theorists to anti-vaxxers to the far right have all congregated around certain themes to do with COVID-19, um, vaccinations, loss of personal freedoms, these kind of ideas. Um, and we see similar themes coming up and again and again. So the, the angles can be slightly changed, the claims can be slightly changed, but there are a lot of familiar material that recirculates in slightly different forms. Some of our most read fact checks may be several months old, in some cases several years old. So one great example is um, we have a fact check that has resurfaced, I think, every year on Australia Day around why Australia Day is held on uh, the day that it is. And obviously that's because every year people start sharing the same material that's incorrect about that and then uh, our fact check will surface again. Um, so the material is relentless. There is so much out of there that it means no matter how big our team grows, no matter how many fact checkers there are around the world, we'll still be only working on a tip of the iceberg to give you an idea of how big the, the problem is or how big the um, need that we're addressing is. Every month, around a million posts around the world on Instagram and Facebook are labelled with our fact checks alone. And we're one of more than 100 um, fact-checking organisations around the world that are accredited with the IFCN, the International Fact-Checking Network. Um, so you can imagine the scale of the problem that's out there. So why do people believe this stuff? It's <laughs> difficult to say, but from what we've seen and our um, understanding of the types of things that appear on social media in particular, um, but can also appear in traditional media, um, there are a few common areas. So one is the distrust of mainstream media and government. It's not a new thing, but social media has certainly given people um, more scope to form communities, to share information quickly and easily to a lot of people. Um, and that ties into the second point there. That reliance on social media is not necessarily a bad thing, but paired with that distrust... Um, you do have a powerful network effect for misinformation when it does take hold. A lot of the misinformation that's presented is presented in very smart ways, so ways that are um, emotive or easily shareable that then will generate that extra traction of uh, the network effect and millions of shares. And then the last one, which is a very important one, is material being shared by trusted sources. So... Research shows that people have a much greater propensity to believe something which they read from someone they trust, which is you know, logically true as well. Um, but that also means that if someone is a prominent source of misinformation that has a trusted following, it doesn't really matter where they steer the misinformation ship, a certain amount of their followers will, will go along on that journey with them. And I think... Everyone has limited time and cognitive resources to process information. So these kind of trusted sources become a, become a way of short-circuiting that lack of time. You know that if someone that you think to be a trusted source shares something, it's probably true, um, and therefore you don't need to fact-check it or interrogate it for yourself. And in the wrong hands, that can be a powerful tool for spreading misinformation. Unfortunately, research also shows that fake news spreads much faster than real news. So that's another thing which we're um, trying constantly to combat. So what does this look like in practice? Some of you might be familiar with Pete Evans, formerly uh, a celebrity chef with Activated Almonds. Um, more recently a COVID-19 conspiracy theorist. Uh, so before his Facebook page was shut down, he had half a million, one and a half million Facebook followers, um, I think around a million Instagram followers as well, um, where people can come for the food and stay for the misinformation. Um, and it, he obviously speaks to a, a very large audience, um, many of whom would also be loyal and like-minded. So... When someone like Pete Evans shares something, it has a very powerful effect on at least a cohort of people. So this is a 
practical example of something that we fact-checked. The first post is uh, an article shared by Pete Evans, and this is a good example of what I mentioned earlier, that um, most misinformation you see in Australia is not necessarily locally cr created. This is a dubious news source, probably based in the US, that he's sharing a link to. And then on the right, you have some of the reactions that he got from his fans. So there are, again, some common themes there that um, COVID-19 is a conspiracy to get people to take vaccines, vaccines are dangerous, vaccines aren't necessary. <laughs> and, and these are the type of things that Pete Evans' followers are reacting to simply by him sharing a, a post. He's not even adding any context. He's just shared the post with the headline appearing. So the core questions that we would ask when we approach this from a fact-checking perspective is who's behind the information? What's the evidence to support what they're saying? And what do other sources say about it? Um, these are very similar themes to what Tafron talked, or, talked about in her talk and the kind of things that journalists would regularly apply to all of their work, hopefully. Um, but we put this information through a kind of very formal process of pulling apart those, those themes. So we'll go through the steps of showing the article that was shared by Pete Evans. Where did it come from? Is that a reliable source? What was the basis for the claims included in their article? What do the primary sources say? So if the basis of the, the article was um, something from the US Food and Drug Administration, what does their actual document or spokesperson say? What do the experts say about it? And then we balance those things and we produce a clear verdict showing what our opinion of the post is based on the facts that we've found. In this case, it's false. Um, and then a simple, after our analysis and our sources and everything else that we include, a clear verdict setting out exactly why we think it's false in easy to digest language. And then on the right, you can see the result of that, which is people who viewed this post or had this post surfaced to them on social media would see this false information flag appear over it. So they can still see the post. It's not being censored. But this trigger, Facebook says, uh, makes people significantly less likely to then click through to the material, um, much less likely to share it. And it also through their algorithms, deprioritizes that content. So instead of that content being shown to potentially millions of people, it might only be shown to thousands of people. So all of that has the effect of limiting the spread of that misinformation. So I've done a lot of talking about fact-checking. Um, how we see this fitting into the the sphere of media literacy, literacy and the kind of importance of this type of work in the broader context of media literacy. We, so we aim at a broad audience, primarily online. Um, as I mentioned, our content is surfaced through Google, through, through Facebook and social media, but we also work with traditional publishers to get our, our fact checks published in um, print media and other places like that. Um, but more importantly, we try to promote critical thinking, the critical thinking that um, Saffron was talking about that journalists apply all of the time um, and show fact-checking as a process that everyone can and should do. So part of the reason why our fact-checks are laid out in the way they are with very transparent sources, links to all of the information that we have drawn on for our fact-check, um, bios for the experts included, is we want to show people don't just take our word for it. If you want to check why we've come to the conclusion that we have, here are all the ways that you can do it, and then teach people to apply those skills themselves. So when they see that post on social media, check where the information may have come from, call it out if they see something that's false. And that's one of the really um, good things to see when you, when you are on social media and, and looking at misinformation all the time, which you know is not the most entertaining pursuit is when you see people who actually do go through that process and call out uh, you know, false information when they see it 
and you don't need to fact check something because someone else just in um, in the comments has already fact checked it for you. So that's the kind of thinking and type of approach that we're promoting, um, as well as that getting people to think themselves before they share content. So act as a circuit breaker went to stop something from spreading too widely. So a little bit about how fact checking works or can work and what it can teach people. Um, this is this chart here is drawn from research produced in 2017 by MIT and the University of Western Australia, looking at perceptions of statements made by Donald Trump before the 2016 election. Essentially, it found that, as you would expect, people who are um, Republicans, strong Trump supporters, are more likely to believe something that Donald Trump says, both when it's true and demonstrably false. However, when people were presented with statements, those statements, and then they were corrected when false, and they were presented with a brief explanation to, as to why they were corrected, all groups were then less likely to believe the false information. And that includes the strong Trump supporters, although the effect was less powerful depending on people's preconceived beliefs. Um, it is worth noting, though, that that effect diminished slightly over time. So after a week, that effect was less powerful, but it, it still lingered. Um, this shows as well that people, as a general rule, are more likely to interrogate claims that run counter to their views than ones that are in line with their views. So part of what we try to do as fact-checkers is um, be non-partisan, to be... Um, broad based, so we're fact checking things from across the political spectrum that fit in with many different potential political and world views um, to show that the same processes apply equally to all material out there. And the people we're trying to reach are obviously people who are, are engaged with information, which is everyone, um, and we're looking to inform and assist those. Um, the only caveat to that is we primarily see ourselves as targeting people who are interested in engaging with objective facts. Um, so that includes people who have strong preconceived beliefs, but for reasons that I'll explain later, there are certain groups who may not be um, reachable with the kind of material that we produce and these approaches, and we accept that. So this is an example of the two types of um, news consumers out there. One is, this is some feedback that we got sent directly about, uh, I don't even know what the fact check is, but we've kind of got a greatest hits there of Bill Gates and depopulation and satanic baby killers gets a run. Um, these are the kind of people that, um, if they have beliefs that are so strongly conceived and so removed from the facts um, that they're not interested in, in engaging with a fact check, then they're probably not people that we can reach with our material. Um, the other type of consumer that we're talking about on the right is someone who's been presented with misinformation, this is on Twitter, um, about... Um, Rupert Murdoch taking regional news grants um, to build a profit in his business. We did a fact check about this, um, and they're they're being called out by someone on on Twitter who's saying, you know, I thought it had, but actually that's not true. So we're trying to engage with those people who can, um, who are interested in engaging with the facts and can be swayed even if it goes against their preconceived beliefs. Um, so. I'll wrap up quickly here, but we are um, looking to extend that work beyond the, the published fact checks that we do. Um, we're looking to support Australians in bringing a critical mindset to the content they read and share. Um, and part of how we're doing that is we are partnering with Facebook to produce um, resources amount around media li literacy and um, debunking fact-checking, so showing people how simple the process is, really, how everyone can do it, and the importance of 
doing that in their own news consumption, their own social media consumption, um, interrogating claims as they see it and thinking before they share, essentially. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, um, Peter. So our final speaker is Sue McCarricka, um, CEO of the Australian Library and Information Association, or ALIA. Um, Sue is a highly experienced media, marketing uh, and advocacy professional and in her role at ALIA she pursues freedom to access information, digital inclusion and media literacy. Sue's presentation is titled Trust Us, We Know the Difference um, and Sue will explain the role of librarians as an important weapon in the fight against misinformation for people across the community. So I'll hand it to you. Thank you. Thank you, Kerry. As soon as somebody says librarians, people leave the room. I don't know why this is. And I will say, this is my first face-to-face -face presentation in a year, so I'm looking for the share screen button. So. Lovely, thank you. So the title is Fact and Fiction, Trust Us, We Know the Difference. Um, I, I feel very at home here today because 40 years ago I started out in my career as a local news reporter on local papers in England and I've been hearing from Saffron and from Caroline and from Peter and I'm thinking, oh, it's back to those days. But of course the world has changed so much. So um, just to give you a brief thing about ALIA, the, the Australian Library and Information Association, most people think about public libraries when they think about libraries, but actually we're the peak body representing the interests of public, school, university, TAFE, health, law, government and other special libraries and our collecting institutions. Um, we're a founder member of the Australian Media Literacy Alliance because our library world is all about information. Um, authentic, good, quality information, which people can use to underpin decisions, make policies, and advance knowledge. So our shared enemy is misinformation, whether that's print or electronic media. And the challenge has grown exponentially, as so much of what we see, read, and hear through the internet is not only deceptive, but as we've heard today, designed to deceive. So digital first is something we, we're getting very used to hearing, particularly from government. And it's an efficient and cost-effective way of delivering services, no doubt about that. But it only works if people are digitally literate, sufficiently astute, tech and media savvy to avoid the scammers, the hackers, the data sharks lurking on the internet. So... How do we reach adult Australians? Because what's happening in schools is amazing. You know, through the, the Australian Media Literary Alli Literacy Alliance, we've found out about ABC education programs, what's happening at the Museum of Australian Democracy, and here at the National Film and Sound Archive, and there are some amazing programs going on. But the reason we're all here today is to talk about the need for an education campaign around media literacy and adult Australians. And the adult Australians particularly who are most vulnerable to misinformation. So the big question is, how do we reach the right people in the right mindset to absorb the conversation? Because it's not something you can just bowl up to somebody and say, hey, let's talk about media literacy. So do we do it through the AFL? We have a diverse community of 993,000 members nationwide support football. Do we do it through Hungry Jacks? They've got 420 stores across Australia. I can see it on the sides of the disposable cups. Let me share with you instead the opportunity presented by Australian Public Libraries. So there are 1,664 shop windows in community. There are 1,400 branch libraries covering every state and territory. Um, and we deliver services to regional and remote Australia, so you're not just talking metro, plus a further 80 mobile outlets that go where many fear to tread, and 177 kiosks, pop-ups, and other service points. And that's very nearly four times the number of Hungry Jacks. So I could say that we can, we can absolutely take on the AFL and Hungry Jacks. We have 
more than 9 million registered members. Now, that's not people who just walk in through the door to read the newspapers. That's people who, who've given us their home address, their details. We can get in touch with those. And that's 36% of the total Australian population. Um, I'm cheating slightly here. This is the opening of Marrickville New Library, just pre-COVID. But there's enthusiasm in that crowd. So that's nine times the membership of the AFL who are registered members of ours. So libraries are really popular. And in a non-COVID year, we have more than 110 million visits. And our users are as diverse as our communities. So let's start with families. Families love libraries. Parents, grandparents, and carers bring their kids to story times, which means that we hold more than 120,000 events each year, attracting over 3 million participants. And, and that's amazing because you get parents and grandparents coming, not just because the kids are entertained free for half an hour and you can put your feet up, but actually so you can actually learn stuff yourself. We get migrants coming in, and this is a good opportunity to start practicing their English. So it's not only about library staff sharing stories and rhymes with preschoolers. It's a learning experience for adults whose first language isn't English. It's an opportunity to connect with other families and to expand your knowledge through the information on the shelves and the adult learning programs that we offer on site. Libraries are also magnets for students, especially when they don't have study space at home. And the more we see high-rise and metro developments, the less space there is at home, the more we need libraries. So it's teens doing their homework, it's tertiary students studying for exams. And I have to say, libraries are the go-to place for older Australians. People who want to keep pace with technology, borrow books and e-books, or simply be around other people. So in May last year, we ran a nationwide survey to find out what library users missed most during the early stages of lockdown. We found that 87% of respondents missed being able to borrow print books, which was understandable, although e-books remained available 24-7. 44% missed having expert-friendly help from the library staff, and 40% missed being around other people and 36% missed participating in events and activities for adults. We have a lot of people using libraries, and they go to libraries because they want to be with other people and they want to learn stuff. So people trust libraries. And I must admit, I had a little moment of um, feeling good about this when Paul was talking at the start. Um, because I feel sad that in my previous life as a journalist, we were losing trust. Mm -hmm. But in libraries, we've managed to maintain it. And it's trust that is the cumulative result of decades, if not centuries, of professional practice. And Paul earlier was talking about skills and values. And I was thinking about that. And I was thinking, that's what we have. And that's what we share with the people who use libraries. Um, and libraries encourage uh, people to be curious. So when Paul said, well, people people will really want the information that reinforces what they already think and the values they hold. I believe that people who come to libraries are expecting to be challenged and that actually that puts them in the right media and mindset to talk about media literacy. So people trust librarians. Um, and as the professional body for library and information professionals, we're very aware that professionalism is something which is held by the individual, irrespective of your workplace. So if you're a doctor and you go into the pub and you say, I'm a doctor, people go, oh, I can trust you, let me buy you a drink. Um, in a bus queue at a party in the pub, if you say you work in a library, people will assume they can trust you. They don't offer you a drink, but they do trust you. <laughs> so media literacy isn't a new thing for us. This uh, chart, which is... It feels a little bit Janet and John now because this was put out by our International Library Association probably five years ago. Um, and of course, we've got all these snazzy media literacy things now. But actually, we've been doing this for a long time. Um, we actually ran a, a training course called Calling Bullshit about three or four years ago. And people were shocked about it. But actually, then said, no, actually, we really need to do this. Um, and I think the thing I'm going to take away from today is that I have learned that it is more honest to be a liar than it is to be a bullshitter. 
I'm taking that with me as a learning. <laughs> so, media literacy isn't new for us. We've been around since 1937, and the first object of our association is to promote the free flow of information and ideas in the interest of all Australians and a thriving culture, economy, environment, and democracy. Because that's the other thing about libraries. We promote democracy, an equal go for all. So we've called it other things. We've called it digital literacy. We've called it information literacy. But media literacy has moved us into a new space where libraries can partners, partner with others more effectively to achieve our goal. And we can't afford to be glib about media literacy. You know, it's very easy to say, oh, yes, let's be media literate. But librarians across the world have identified challenges around how we balance media literacy with that thing around censorship and cancel culture. And those things can be carried out under, under the guise of tackling misinformation and fake news, but actually they're a bad thing. And I would like to just share with you an example which popped up to us about last week, I think. I'm looking at Trish, my colleague in the audience. Last week, it was a gorgeous example where an Adelaide Council decided to do the right thing on International Women's Day and instructed the library to remove, to remove Women's Day, New Idea, and other magazines which were toxic and full of misinformation. Now, I don't know how many hours it took for those magazines to be back on the shelves after the community rallied and said, but we love that stuff. We need it back. And we know it's misinformation, but we still love it. And going to, to Peter's point of, how do we make people love news and not fake information? We've got to make news more fun. I'm oh, sorry. Anyway, so. But libraries are perfectly positioned. Um, we are perfectly placed to be part of the media literacy solution for adult Australians. And I'm just going to repeat the numbers. We have got 1,664 locations. And most of those have community meeting rooms so we can bring people together. We have 9.3 million registered members, people who have volunteered and are currently on our database. In a normal year, we have 110 million visits, and we run 273,000 programs, more than a quarter of a million programs each year, attracting 7.4 million attendees. And people come to us because they're seeking information and information-related experiences. So they're in the right mindset. So that's a snapshot of what Australian public libraries have to offer. I hope you can see some ways that we could work together to build adult media literacy in response to the report that's being released tomorrow, but actually we're going to hear about it very shortly. And I'd like to congratulate Tanya Notley, Simon Chambers, Sora Park, and Michael Deswani for this excellent piece of work. I've seen their work over, over the months, and I really believe they are doing world-class research in this area. So I would just like to say, if you can see the opportunity, we would love to hear from you. There are my details. Please give us a call. Thank you. Um, and I'm sure every uh, member of the audience enjoyed, um, wow, such incredibly insightful, um, surprisingly, although I shouldn't be surprised given that Sora Park put this team together, <laughs> complimentary um, and, um, yeah, and, and actually in many ways challenging um, suite of presentations. So, um, Sora, is there a roving mic or... Um, if people want, I'm so I'm going to ask some questions to start with, um, but I can just hand my my mic down. If anyone from the audience would like to ask a question, um, just let me know, and you can come down, and I'll I'll pass my microphone microphone over. But there were so many themes um, that came out in the four presentations that I'd like to get you guys talking to one another because I think there's, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, good, good uh, talent in the room. So 
Um, I'll start with a question, and but I'm, uh, I'll, I'll ask um, Caroline to start with, and um, but I would like you know everybody to to jump in and, and ideally get you guys in into conversation. And look, the question um, has to be about trust. Um, we've seen uh, some you know, exceptional um, interventions in different contexts uh, that are happening all around, all across the society, from, from policy interventions, um, public services like libraries, in media organisations and in the school and community sector. But at the same time, and I'm, I'm reflecting here on, um, on Paul's presentation this morning, um, we know that there's a declining trust in institutions uh, across the society. Um, so I suppose who's best placed um, to, to, to manage the media literacy um, <laughs> challenge and is, is mistrust universal or is it in pockets? I'd like to know from your, your experiences on the coal face um, what, your, what your views are. Wow, big question. Um, who's, um, who sh is best placed to deal with media literacy? Uh, we all are in this fabulous alliance and network. Um, I think that, you know, everyone is unanimous here in understanding that it's, it's not a battle to be fought alone and that harnessing everyone's expertise and coordinating that ideally has some funding behind it would be great. And look, the model we've got here costed it cheap. Cheap. Two million bucks. That's all cost a year. So, um, you know, any any generous government could certainly find a hollow log with two million dollars in it. Um, the, the, uh, I'm really deadly serious about this actually because that two million would really be around the co the program coordinator's uh, role and um, and some evaluation research, etc. Because the delivery of the programs is actually through the networks because all of those places are already set up to deliver and educate. And the thing is about what they're, what they're teaching and the development of those materials and effectively that's the program coordinator, coordinator and, the, and the network would sort of, you know, help coordinate all of that. So it really would be a terribly price effective um, intervention. However, back to <laughs> um, the trust question. Are there parts of society that are less trusting than others? Uh, yes, in relation to news. Um, you'd, you'd be surprised though. Uh, it's not as, you know, you can't say, oh yes, it's people with low, you know, low levels of education, etc., um, that are, you know, less trusting than others. It really is across the spectrum. Uh, there are people with high education who are very uh, untrusting and uh, and people with low education levels who are very high trusting. Um, it's a terrible question, Kerry, and I don't think I can answer it. No, you've done, you've done <laughs> So you described um, a group that, that does have high levels of trust. So how does that group deal with, um, with perhaps cynicism about, in other, about other sectors or other institutions? Can I answer the first question rather than that one? <laughs> Actually, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, look, I, I was just thinking as as Caroline was struggling with that, and I was thinking, why do why have librarians maintained trust? And obviously, it's because they're all fantastic. But in Journalists addition, to that, are also really fantastic. They are, but not the, all of them. But <laughs> but the difference is, we don't have to monetize what we do. So as soon as you introduce manipulation, whether that's manipulation to make money or that, whether that's manipulation to gain votes, but I think politicians and the, the government world has lost because people no longer see it as an altruistic thing, but they see that, that unfortunately some people have manipulated it and that's lost trust all over. With um, I've seen you know the media go from um, being the fourth estate, you know, being the trusted source to being commercially required. The more clicks you can get, the more you can push things through, the better. Libraries have not suffered that because we're very fortunate to be funded by local state governments. 
Can I just add to that, back to that though? That, that is absolutely true and back to the term bullshit. Um, there's a great study done out of Reuters called Bias, Bullshit and Lies into Trust and Why People Don't Trust the News and Journalism and it's for those three reasons. Um, yeah, lack so, of independence. Saffron, you spoke about the principles of journalism. Do you want to, do you want to talk a little bit about um, the principles of journalism versus um, the perhaps commercial imperatives that, in which you know, a lot of journalists work? Yeah, I think um, uh, I think to to be fair to to journalists that most of them would at least strive to to carry out those um, those sort of pr underlying principles of of the job every day. Um, you know, we have problems in Australia which are mirrored in different ways around the world of sort of concentration of media ownership in Australia and perceptions of you know political bias and so forth, which I think have become. Um, for a whole host of reasons that we probably don't have time to go into today, we definitely don't, but um, have become more pronounced in recent years with the, you know, rise of social media and people going directly to the source, um, you know, with um, the, the, the business model of journalism collapsing um, and so there being a sort of more of a desperation to keep that audience at, at all cost. Um, at all costs. So, I mean, there are, there are definitely legitimate concerns um, with the trust in media organisations and unfortunately that's reflected then on the journalists, individual journalists, and I actually see the two as, as a bit separate um, because journalists, as I say, most of them, including ones that, you know, and I've, I've you know, been absolutely shouted down on Twitter for saying this, is that most News Corp journalists are actually just doing their job every day and to the best of their ability. Um, you know, if you don't like Rupert and you don't like their columnists and their headlines, that's actually not on this individual reporter who's working for a Queensland, you know, country paper somewhere and reporting on the local councillor affair, you know, like, let's be fair here, you know. So I think that's what I mean by the principles of journalism and those are the things that I think are very transferable, those, you know, principles and skills. Um, and I think through it, through the media literacy process as a byproduct of that, we can hopefully um, get back, which is, you know, partly what my book um, will hopefully do, is is getting people at least trusting in those skills and the, and the skill set behind journalism. So rather than, um, you know, not asking anyone to have faith in large media organisations that are profit-driven, um, but... Yes, to have faith in the, the process, I guess, and the process that Peter talked about. And that's the only other thing I'd add in, in relation to libraries being publicly funded is that we've got a very, very particular view of journalism in Australia and it's quite unique to Australia now in terms of the, um, the developed world is that we assume that journalism has to be privately funded and I am very much against that idea. I think, you know, we've got AAP really you know, breaking new ground with being a, you know, a national newswire that is not for profit. Um, I think we have to see more of that in Australia. And the one of the things that government needs to do is make it a lot easier for news to act as, as not for profits. Um, and yeah, it's funny, I remember doing an interview with the ABC um, a little while ago and saying, you know, um, that this idea that we shouldn't see an imperative for news to make money and the interviewer said to me, Oh, you know, I said, you know, you don't, you don't expect to, you know, pay more than whatever five bucks to go to the public pool. Why should be you be expected to pay an absolute mountain for what we all should have a right to as as citizens in a democracy, which is information, you know, to make decisions about our lives? And he, the interviewer, I won't name it, was Robbie Bach in Sydney, <laughs> laughed at me. And, um, and said, oh, that's ridiculous. I mean, you know, news, news isn't public pools. And I said, well, I didn't say it. But, um, but, you know, he's working for the ABC, the publicly funded ABC, as he was asking me these questions. And I'm like, well, there should be more of that, um, that approach to journalism, which is that we should actually see it as a right to have um, access to quality information. And, and that goes for all age groups. And I'll, I'll get off my soapbox now. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, did you have a reflection on, on that? Yeah, I, I think my only reflection is that I don't think, from my perspective, media literacy, particularly in the news space, is not about getting people to trust the media or getting people to trust government. I think it's about the difference between a healthy and an unhealthy mistrust. So part of journalistic training is to not trust the government, for example, or at least not take anything that you're told at face value. So then as a journalist, you can't turn around to people and say, but take everything the media says at face value. I think the processes that both Saffron and I talked about, using those kind of journalistic techniques to 
interrogate everything to question, you know, the the motivation behind something that's being said. Um, make sure you check the source behind it. Look for independent, verifiable facts or um, counter information before working out if something is true and or useful to you is something that is really useful to apply not only to stuff that you see on social media or um, stuff that you might be you know, told by a politician. It's also really useful to apply to the media. So I think it's about showing people that you, you shouldn't trust the media as an amorphous mass. You shouldn't even trust one outlet that you see as being particularly trusted. You should always you know, get your information from a range of sources. You should interrogate that information. So there's, you're sort of describing a, um, a, a, a level of critical thinking versus a deep cynicism, which I think was what, you know, what Paul was sort of worrying about. So there's sort of there's little glimpses of hope, isn't there, in the, in the, in the debate. Um, I'll stick with you for the moment, Peter. You described a, a fast-paced, fast-changing um, media environment in which fact-checking is one, one mechanism or technique that's being used... Um, to combat misinformation, um, is it possible for uh, media organisations or for perhaps librarians or other um, other fact checkers um, to to keep up with what's going on in the in the in the changing sort of digital environment? No. <laughs> that was easy. <laughs> um, no, I think as I as I mentioned. Unfortunately, the research shows that misinformation spreads faster than true information in general. Um, so what we're doing, what any other fact-checking organisation is doing, is just the tip of the iceberg. And I think there is some, some um, efforts to counter misinformation with facts can be counterproductive when it's not presented in a way that enables people to uh, interrogate them for themselves. So, for example, you know, it's quite common around a public health campaign for government websites to have frequently asked questions that dispel popular myths about, about a vaccine, for example. That's not... I'm not saying that's counterproductive, but there will be a certain cohort of people that that won't reach even if even if they read it they won't believe it yeah. and I think part of the reason for that is because it's presented in a way that says trust us not trust us because just trust yeah, us okay. and I think I suppose in an ideal world you wouldn't need fact checkers you wouldn't need that kind of uh, third party producing that factual information because everyone would be actively seeking out all the nuggets that you then pull together that become a fact check for themselves. That's probably not possible because people don't have the time. I mean, it's a very um, labour intensive task. But I think the kind of thing that we're looking to do that would be useful to people is equipping them with those tools so that sure, the misinformation will move faster than yeah, okay. we can ever yep. move or the media can move or um, groups like the Library Association or anyone else can move, but people's ability to digest that information and get what is meaningful and useful out of it um, and discard the rest, that ability will be able to move just as fast. Sue, so, um, in the library context? Well... I I would agree with Peter. If you look at individuals keeping up with technology, the answer is no, nobody can. But I think what happens in the library world is that we do groupthink. So I would like to share with you an example of where we've harnessed the technology to do amazing work. Um, we have health librarians working across hospitals and, and health situations, and they've set up live uh, search streams. So they're actually scanning the internet using these live search streams. And it's, it's like watching ticker tape go through. You can see the very latest COVID facts, COVID research. So that health practitioners could 
uh, go onto their hospital database and just see what the very latest, within the last 30 minutes, what was being said around the world, because we'd sourced this. And we were feeding out from Australia into the world system. We were having it fed back from the US and all over. And actually, that's harnessing the technology and harnessing the power of information experts. Great. Um, Saffron or Caroline, do you want to... Make yeah, a I was comment gonna, about that? I was just going to say very briefly that I think one of the things I really like about the media literacy approach is that um, it once you've once you've imparted the principles to people um, and given them the tools and the skills, it shouldn't matter what technology or platform um, they encounter after that. They should be able to apply those same critical thinking skills to each new iteration of YouTube or Facebook or you know, what was that other one? MySpace, you know. So then Facebook will go the way of MySpace. At some point we'll be, you know, we'll have something else. Um, you know, computers will change, you know, the tablets will morph into something else. And I think that's what's so amazing about those media literacy skills is you can take them with you throughout your life, with, throughout changes, um, and the, the, the core sort of critical thinking skills don't change. Yeah, great. Look, we've only got a couple of moments left, um, but I would love it if someone from the, um, from the audience... Wanted to ask a question? Yes, um, Sue from the University of Canberra. Do you want me to yell? Yeah, to if you're happy to yell. I don't want anyone tripping down the stairs. Um, I'd like to pick up on something Paul said earlier as well, but it's sort of more in the context of how do we actually get people to care? In the sense that if you're going onto social media for entertainment and all that sort of stuff, and Sue's comment about we have to make the news more fun. I get that too, but if people are going on there, and Paul said something interesting in his talk about maybe social media isn't the platform where we should be having civic discussions potentially, then where do we have them? But you know, it goes to my question of how do how do we make people care about whether what they're reading is true or not? I'll start with Carol. Why, why is it important? <laughs> yeah. I mean, oh, we understand obviously. Yeah. I think it's a really interesting uh, question and an important one because, <laughs> let's face it, media literacy, it's not very sexy. Um, you know, ethics isn't very sexy either. They, these are hard things to kind of make interesting, you know. Um, and I think the big thing that Paul talked about in his uh, talk was that, you know, we are all all seeking confirmation, you know, confirmation bias. We, we, we read information and think, oh, yeah, well, that accords with my point of view, so it must be right. So even trying to um, isolate information for individuals that they might even question, you know, what is one person's misinformation and someone else's truth? And so I think that that's really hard. A lot of the time people don't know that they're looking at misinformation because it accords with their their worldview. So I think these are fundamentally really important questions. There is no immediate answer. But I think I think that's right. Yeah, it, it's, it's a good question. I think you can do it by making it relevant to people. Um, so in the specific case of what I've done, you know, I haven't written a book saying media literacy for children aged 10 to, you know, whatever. <laughs> I've written Kid Reporter, The Secret to Breaking News. And I've made it about, you know, Dana and I made it about, you know, how do you, how do you start it, you know, school podcast yourself um, but then we've woven in all this media literacy information and I think while you probably have to find the niche for you know for different groups in society I think it's really doable I think that the number one thing just like you know you do when you write a you know a news story you, you try to make it relevant to your audience and I think that's what we've got to do with media literacy and what I love about this forum is that we're, we're taking it out of the research and the academic heads. We're using that information and how do we do that in the real world? Um, and whether it's at a library or at a school, I think it's, it's actually eminently doable. It just requires a bit of thought as to, you know, which group needs what. I think, I think there are a couple of answers here. One for me is friends and family. So I think, you know, a government information campaign that is, you know, an article in The Age and an article in the Sydney Morning Herald... That's not going to do it. But um, we know that in libraries, when somebody says, oh, that's, I'm going to tell my family about that, and the next week you get a whole group of people coming back saying, can I do that program because that sounds really good. And it's, it's that grassroots kind of thing where it, it goes around. So I think, I think that's, for us really, friends and family would be the way to spread the message and the, and the thing. But I think also, when you look at society and you look at the way young people are... Um, 
really uh, taking to, to, uh, to task the whole concept of climate change. They, they want a better world. They can see what a mess my generation has made of it. And they're saying we want this to be better. So I think we've got the right moment in time to actually do something about this. Just one very small comment at the end. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm obviously coming this particularly from a perspective of misinformation, disinformation. I don't, from my perspective, I don't, I don't think the problem is that people don't care. Um, I think most misinformation, as distinct from disinformation, comes from a place of caring. So if you take the example of um, anti-vaccine misinformation, it usually comes from a good place. The good place is, you know, a parent wanting what's best for their children or someone wanting what's best for their own health. The problem is that that then takes a certain turn that then means people don't trust trustworthy sources of information. So I think it, it kind of comes back to what we've all been saying around equipping people with the skills. Um, I think the, the key element in the kind of, well, taking the fact that people already care about getting what's right and just, uh, I suppose, showing them that what they believe to be right may not be in a way that can be uh, absorbed. Uh, not calling it media literacy is probably a good start. <laughs> Take out for the day, let's find a new name for media literacy. No, just joking. Uh, all right, I'd like to uh, ask you all to thank our panellists for their wonderful presentations and... Enjoy some afternoon tea before we come back for the, um, the launch of the report, the pre-launch of the report. <laughs> okay.